so we're going to do something a little different. I'm going to read this article that, that a couple people have been posting. I read through some of it. I haven't read through all of it. Um, so there is a uh, disclosure uh, about that. Um, I haven't read through all of it, but we're going to read it together. So I hope you guys are, are, are cool with that. So we'll, we'll read through it. I'll do a couple responses. It's somewhat lengthy, and I'll do my best uh, at reading. I'm not here. This is another disclaimer at the top, too. Uh, I'm not the best reader in the world. Um, I always used to get embarrassed when I was in uh, in middle school about reading. Um, I, I would I would always that, that's sort of my uh, Achilles heel, if you will, is reading out loud. So I'm, I'm being very vulnerable by doing this, you guys. Uh, it's a super vulnerable moment for your for your boy Krish Mohan. So uh, let's see. Let's make sure I'm doing this right. There we go. Okay. So. This is on Cora. It's an article titled, can you guys see this? Uh, yeah, okay, it's showing up. Um, what liberals don't realize. That's the title of the article. What most, what most liberals, what don't most liberals realize? See, I told you, I'm fucking it up already. <laughs> what don't most liberals realize? Uh, it's by this guy named Peter Kruger. Um, he's at the... Mitchell Hamlin School of Law, and uh, this is a this is from a couple about a month ago. He wrote this, right? Um, Cora is, I guess, like a website where you can kind of sign sign in and, and write these essays like this. Um, sometimes they're on point, other times they're not. Uh, but I like them. I think they're cool. Uh, I found some value in um, in them. So let's begin reading. So uh, he starts the article. I'm in a bit of a unique position. To answer this, I suppose, as I also note in my companion answer to the corresponding conservative question, I'm a never Trumper and I believe in careful, measured, restrained, deliberate progress. My more liberal friends are convinced I'm a conservative, but most conservatives seem convinced I'm somewhere left of Karl Marx. Here's the thing the Overton window of this country has moved way far over to the right. Like, even the Democrats are legislating for like more right wing ideas than they are left wing ideas, right? Like, you really have to twist their arm. Like, even Nancy Pelosi is like, like, there was a story that came out saying that Nancy Pelosi was going to um, look into universal basic income. And she said, I never said that. I don't want to say that. I said maybe some kind of a paycheck protection something. Um, and she, and you know, like they're still not advocating for this universal basic income because it will fundamentally shift what it means to be a Democrat in this country. Anyway, let's keep reading. Uh, I grew up a short distance away from the birthplace of the Republican party, which was a liberal and highly progressive party when it was created. I might point out, I had immediate family in the Grange, uh, a progressive Republican organization of farmers for most of its history. I was probably in college before I, I met a Democrat, right? And he's right. Uh, Lincoln was the first Republican president, very progressive uh, president by, uh, by, by all means of it. Uh, so we'll keep reading. By the time I was old enough to be aware of pol politics, most people around me listened to WTMJ, not sure what that is, uh, Charlie Sykes, I, I do know that name, and Republicanism had turned uh, conservative and reactionary. The Tea Party was highly active and successful in my hometown and school district. My county broke 60-30 for Trump. How did an era of La Follette progressive farmers barely 100 years ago become what it is today? I've talked about this idea too. Um, if you remember, uh, I don't know if, you, if, if anybody checked it out or not, but I, I talked about Blair Mountain um, in West Virginia being this hotbed for these progressive socialist worker based ideas, right? This, this battle for, for, um, unions and the working class. And that was in 1921. And then we move forward to almost a hundred years from now, even in less than a hundred years for the last like 30 years, West Virginia has seen these like cousin fucking hicks, these toothless assholes, right? And how did that happen? How do we go from the bastion of fighting for worker rights against the against corporatism against this like this 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 corporate slavery to calling these people hicks 
and uneducated and stuff like that. So he goes on, he's, he's gonna, he talks about these farmers, these progressive farmers, right? Uh, progressivism started failing them, them specifically. And this enlarge what I think liberals have tended to fail to consider. I understand that I'm likely to be a bit stereotypical here in lumping liberals in with city people. The, there are liberals in rural areas, sure. Most of them have a, already realized a lot of what I'm writing. And this is where I tour. So I, I've kind of seen this. I, a lot of people give me shit for the places that I tour, right? I tour a lot down south. I tour a lot in the Midwest. Um, and these are these tend to be more rural areas. And those are the areas where people come out and they might be considered conservative or they might be considered libertarian or what have you but they enjoy what I'm saying. They believe in what I'm saying. They agree with me for the most part. And whatever disagreements we have, we're able to sit down and over a beer and talk about it. Whereas in places like Asheville, North Carolina, or Portland, Oregon, or even San Francisco, which have become these faux progressive neoliberal cities, uh, where, you know, as long as they say nice things and say, we support gay people, but then fund the, 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 anti-gay kind of candidate because they look good and whatever, right? These neoliberal, like let's profit belief systems kind of thing. Whenever I go to those cities, I get, I take a lot of shit for what I'm saying, for, for standing with the working class, for saying that we shouldn't uh, support the oligarchy. We shouldn't support Joe Biden. <laughs> um, so, uh, where are we at? Okay. For the most part, most outspoken liberals are not rural folks. The ones that dominate the Democratic Party are typically from urban areas. This is, as I have looked into the history of things, an artifact of the 20th century. There were formerly progressive wings in both major parties, but into the 20th century, the Republican Party tended to move more and more rural rather than just north. Republicans had always tended to be more pro-capital through the late 19th century, while labor was more a Democratic plank. The, there was a pro-labor progressive movement for a brief time that really held sway over the Republican Party leaders with uh, Republican Party with leaders such as Theodore Roosevelt, Henry Cabot Lodge, Robert Feitenbaum La Follet, and William Howard Taft. All of that is almost true. Um, Teddy Roosevelt, I will say, did try to pull away from the profitization of the Republican Party itself because he went up against Taft and Taft went straight to the delegates because he was like, none of these fucking mooks are fucking making the decisions. The delegates are picking the candidate for the party. So I'm going to circumvent all of this nonsense and go directly to the delegates. Teddy Roosevelt saw that was happening, felt that it was bullshit and created the Bull Moose Party. I've talked about the Bull Moose Party. I'm writing about the Bull Moose Party. Um, and that was a progressive wing. It was an anti-corporate populist party uh, in the early 1900s. So this is almost accurate. Taft wasn't really um, part of that progressive wing. Teddy Roosevelt lost. He got 20% of the votes, but he lost. Um, and, uh, and then the Bull Moose Party kind of dissolved, and most of them went back to being Republicans anyway. So maybe that's where he's assessing that information from. I don't know. But rural organizations like the Grange, were the most progressive pro-labor force in agricultural regions like the Midwest, kind of like the, um, the coal workers union was in uh, West Virginia. As the Republican Party lost its progressive wing in the early 20th, early 20th century into intra-party fighting between the more measured Roosevelt progressives and the more radical La Follette Republicans, the conservative pro-capital wing regained control of the party with leadership such as Warren Harding and Herbert Hoover. Uh, I have to look into La Follette. Maybe that'll be something that I talk about later this week. Um, now, Woodrow Wilson solidified a pro-labor progressive contingent within the Democratic Party when the Republican coalition fell apart in 1912. Uh, uh, bullshit, actually. That is super false. Uh, Woodrow Wilson was a neoliberal capitalist, <laughs> a pro-war neoliberal capitalist. Woodrow Wilson is the reason why we have the Espionage Act. Woodrow Wilson is the reason why we don't trust whistleblowers. Woodrow Wilson is the reason why Julian Assange is still in fucking prison 
for revealing the truth about American war crimes and corporate fraud on a global scale. Woodrow Wilson went up against a, a true pro-worker, pro-labor candidate named Eugene V. Debs, who ran in the Socialist Party of America. Woodrow Wilson was not a fucking progressive. Woodrow Wilson is what the mainstream Democratic Party actually fucking is. So I got to disagree uh, with, with, the, with the author here, with Peter here, uh, because that is uh, super wrong. Okay, this was primarily aimed at unionization, which in turn uh, tended to be more heavily favored uh, in the increased industrialization and urbanization of the country. By the time that Franklin Delano, Delano Roosevelt was elected to office, Republicans were increasingly becoming the party of the rural areas and the Northeast, and the Democrats were increasingly becoming the party of the cities. That might be true. I'm, 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 I'm not super familiar with the, with, with the history of kind of that split that happened um, it might have happened during FDR. It might have happened a little after FDR. Um, so uh, I, I'm not particularly sure. But I do think that the Democratic Party was not about unionization um, until FDR came into power. Uh, Wilson actively fought against any sort of unionization. He called it Bolshevism. He used McCarthyist tactics before they were McCarthyist. We should really call it Wilsonist uh, if, uh, if, 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 if we're being totally accurate about it, uh, Woodrow Wilson put out the, I mean, the espionage act is kind of the lead in to McCarthyist principles. Okay. Uh, that split was torn open by the passage of the civil rights act of 1964 and other progressive reforms of the late 1960s, the conservative Dixiecrats of the rural South finally abandoned party loyalty for ideological loyalty and switch sides when conservative leadership within the Republican Party worked out a deal to provide them with continued seniority, starting with Strom Thurmond. Joe Biden's really good friend. <laughs> Joe Biden worked with Strom Thurmond <laughs> and, and supported like segregation. <laughs> so um, this urban rural divide, he was a Dixiecrat. This urban rural divide had continued to accelerate to today, evident in this electoral map, uh, such as these from the 2016 election. I don't know how many of you guys can see this. Um, you, 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 you might be able to see it a little bit more clearly on your screen. I'm not entirely sure, uh, but uh, that's a lot of red, folks. Uh, and this is, it's a, lot of, uh, it's a lot of where I tour, to be honest. Right, like the middle of this country, uh, I was I, I went deep south. Uh, I went from Alabama uh, into te into the the Arkansas area, into Tennessee, into Texas, Louisiana, and up into the Midwest around Chicago, and then came home. That was my last tour. That whole big swath of fucking red. That's where I tour. That's that's my bread and butter, you guys fucking red states in 2016 i was in these areas by the way most of them uh this is adjusted for population and this is a, an election map i'm not really sure exactly what this map is and this map seems very weird uh it's a 3d map i guess it's showing you where where there's a democratic and republican presence uh, I don't bring this up to get into a debate about the electoral college, only to point out urban-rural divide. Okay, that's fine. Uh, so one, the, it's an ideology. Uh, uh, it's not an ideology or even a partisanship. It's about rural consciousness. Okay, if you haven't read Captain Kramer's outstanding work in uh, the politics of resentment, I haven't. I, you really, really should. I probably will. Uh, <laughs> as I read it, I was stunned at how well she described my hometown and the people in it. Uh, I don't know if one of the test groups she had was actually in my town, but it might as well have been. It was eerily familiar. You know, I remember reading an article in uh, in in 2016 before the election about how uh, the more rural areas of, uh, and this might be, she might be the author of it because I can't remember the author of it, but it basically talked about how these like rural farmers in uh, like northern Wisconsin were kind of resentful of Madison and Milwaukee, Wisconsin, because all the rules were made in regards to what farmers in that little area wanted. Um, and she said, like, these guys basically said, 
that they don't feel represented and they don't feel heard, um, which is why they're, they were more likely to vote for Trump because they feel like Trump, um, you know, uh, listened to them. So maybe that's kind of the same thing. I, I'm, I'm going to have to check that out and revisit it if that is the same thing. Because I remember reading it going, yeah, this fucking explains a whole lot of shit. It explains all of the things I'm hearing while I'm on tour. Okay, Kramer discovered that rural people very much have their own social identity, and they feel that it's, it, it is both under attack and worthy of preservation, and that it is not justified. The politics are dominated by the increasingly concentrated population of urban areas. Without geographical representation, like the Electoral College, or what liberals point out is an unfair weight uh, of the rural vote, there is a fear one that is often realized that city folk will simply come in, invade them, and impose their city-minded views on them. Which is so interesting because this sounds like rural gentrification, doesn't it? It kind of sounds like rural gentrification. <laughs> it's what poor people get scared whenever, like the you know, like the like the the richy rich move into the area. You know, like those yuppies move in because uh, they got a job at the tech company and they're making like 125k starting and they're like we just brought this home and we're going to renovate it and do all these things to it and everybody else in the neighborhood that's like oh god are you going to increase the property value and fuck me out of my house like it kind of sounds like that <laughs> when you hear rural people wanting deregulation and complain about overreach they're just latching onto terms that describe what they experience I can't tell you how many farmers or rural county executives I know that are pissed to hell at the state because it seems like every year there is some new un unfunded mandate or regulation or tax law. There may be and usually a very good reasons for these things, but they aren't explained to my people. It's just another uh, edict from Madison and Milwaukee. I, so it sounds like it is the thing that I read. Um, they have a lower tax basis and lower economies of scale because of the lack of population density. Progressive policies often fail to take into account uh, and raise revenue by raising statewide property taxes. This massively disproportionate hits massively di disproportionately hits rural people who tend to be land rich and money poor. Land is a great asset, but it is not a liquid one. So when we're barely breaking even most years, and two shitty seasons away from complete insolvency and China and California and giant agri-corps are dumping cheap milk and pork into the system, uh, we're kind of fucked when you start demanding another thousand bucks a year from us. That's a fair concern. That's a fair concern. Um, you know, and, and because, they're, because they are land rich, if you increase property taxes on them without saying why you're increasing property taxes on them. I mean, you could do the same thing for companies like Monsanto, for, for Chinese-based companies, right? Um, and that's what a lot of other companies do is they buy up property. In fact, that's kind of the thing that we're seeing now is based on how things are going, based on the debt market that's being created uh, because of back rent, back mortgages and things like that, um, we're going to see property getting seized up by wealthy people, by other countries. The parking meters in Chicago are owned by Dubai. They just bought up the property where the parking meters are. So, like, you're not helping the city of Chicago when you pay a parking meter. You're helping Dubai. This is, like, very typical of what happens. Companies come in, they buy land, and then those companies get nationalized in a different country, and then now that country owns a piece of land in America because it's a corporate loophole because the public sector and the private sector are interconnected and owned by the same shit. It's a very, like, serious fucking thing. <laughs> Okay, so Minnesota is trying something that might help in the form of a tax credit for agricultural land when school districts want to pass a referendum so that farmers that are disproportionately impacted by property tax hikes don't get hit as hard. This is a good idea and a way to help show that progressive policies don't have to end up breaking them. Cool. This should be looked into and 
tried to be applied. This is something I, I'll, I'll probably look into and try to understand it. Uh, <laughs> number two, liberals can be pretentious as fuck sometimes. Yes, uh, he, he has a, 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 a little dialogue from, uh, from Firefly. Great show. Um, big fan of that show. Uh, and as my people consider liberals to be smug elitists that look down on them and both sides are not unjustified. Look at what you see, uh, TV representing, representing my people. The positive end of the stick is that, uh, the naivete of Parks and Rec. Uh, what do we more commonly see ourselves portrayed as? Called on national television. Rednecks, inbred hicks, toothless hillbillies, racists and homophobes clinging to their guns and Bibles. Yeah, I know if you take Obama's entire quote in context, it's speaking precisely to this problem, but the soundbite was all my people heard. And I mentioned this a few minutes ago is, yeah, this is exactly what I'm kind of baffled by because when I go down south, when I go into the Midwest, when I go into these rural areas, I meet more progressive people, people that you wouldn't think are traditionally progressive. Stuart Huff and I were in Kalamazoo a few years ago, and I know I've told this story uh, probably at some point in this, in, in, in some video, but we saw a guy at our show wearing a shirt that says, you can pry my gun from my cold dead hands. And we were like, well, this guy's out. He's probably going to say some shit in the middle of the show. He fucking loved us. He loved it. And he came up and talked to Stuart, bought five of his CDs and two of mine uh, because he ran out of cash. And then, uh, and then he basically said, I live in the country. I live 40 minutes outside of Kalamazoo and I need my guns to protect myself from like animals that come on my property. And I also have like a quarter mile driveway. So people don't show up unless I invite them or I know they're coming over. So yeah, I got to be a little bit protective, but I don't think everybody should just own them willy nilly. You should have a reason for owning them and you should know what you're doing with like he was pretty reasonably minded and we made a we made a judgment call and we were the assholes in that situation. Uh, look, this, is, this isn't entirely your fault, liberals. I grew up with the uh, Jew jokes and black jokes and rampant homophobia. Uh, a family member who was a coach once yelled to one of his kids, run like a Mexican with a TV on his shoulder. I'm not kidding. It's that bad. Fuck, that's crazy. <laughs> oh, my God. That's so wild. You know what's funny? Um, I've heard crazy, you know, stereotypical racist jokes like that from both sides. I literally had a Democrat come up to me. Um, she walked up and she said, it's so great that you're doing your show. The show is called How Not to Fit In. It's one of like the earliest albums I put out back in 2016 or something. And uh, the whole show is about like how I don't fit into both American culture and, um, you know, Indian culture, right? I don't fit into either of them. And I talk about that and, sh and she was like, I'm so excited. You know, you don't see a lot of Indian comics, blah, blah, blah. Super excited about it. I thought she was going to love the show. And she came up to me after the show and she goes, you know, it would have been really nice if you, uh, if you did the accent a little bit. If you spoke with the accent, it would be really nice. Uh, I think that would be really, uh, it would enhance the act. Also, you know, what happened to all the stereotypes? Like she literally said, what happened to all the stereotypes? How come I didn't hear any jokes about 7-Eleven? How come I didn't hear any jokes about, and I've had this conversation with conservative club owners that have told me I need 7-Eleven jokes with liberal club owners that said I need 7-Eleven jokes. <laughs> like this sort of shit happens all the time. All right. Uh, I don't want to make any excuses for that, but here's why context matters. We didn't have any of those people in our community with the exception of homosexual people, though we certainly didn't know any of those. Homosexuality was one of those things that was pointedly ignored. I had a great aunt and uncle who uh, lived with a friend all my life. <laughs> my family still won't acknowledge the truth of it. Uh, yeah, you know what show kind of really did a great job of addressing that was New Girl. Schmidt wouldn't accept that his mom was a lesbian for like a good like three seasons and they kind of very subtly uh addressed it and and like pulled Schmidt out of it like it was it was really well done uh but yeah they're right uh, I was I was the minority kid in my school for a while like there weren't weren't a lot of black kids in my school there weren't a lot of Mexican kids like I was diversity in my school for a little while 
Um, that changed. Fortunately, uh, that changed. So, uh, yeah, I, uh, I completely understand that. And that's part of the reason why, you know, when you look at media and there isn't proper representation and isn't just a stereotypical representation, like people look at the media and they think that I'm that fucking Indian kid from the Big Bang Theory where they're just like, oh, you probably are scared of girls and can't talk to them when they're around. It's amazing that you go up on stage with women in the audience and say words out loud into a microphone. And it's just like, great, okay, thanks, fucking CBS, right? Like, that's kind of what people think because they've never met an Indian person before or they never met a Mexican person. So they see these stereotypes. It's part of the reason why I stopped doing stereotype jokes in my act, or if I did them, I subverted them. I flip them. I satirize them. Um, it's why I don't straight up just fucking do stereotypes. Uh, and I lost my place. Sorry. Hold on. Okay. <laughs> I've tried to explain it to my people. Uh, most of them won't listen. You can look at the comments I receive from certain people when I've written about white privilege as exhibit A. I, I get basically the same trying uh, to explain... Explain it to people back home. When I used to try to explain it to them, I was considering one of them smug, pretentious elitists who got a degree and thinks I'm better than them now. It took time for me to learn how to have those conversations in a way that helped me realize uh, the real harm those things cause. Yeah, and that's super difficult because I have dated a lot of uh, a lot of girls. Like my ex-wife's family was pretty conservative, um, and I'm basically like a hippie, lefty socialist. Right. Um, you know, where I'm like, fucking work a revolution. Let's do this shit. And they're like, we need our Bibles. Uh, and I would sit down and the first thing I would do is listen to them. Tell me what's up. And then we would talk about it. And I would go, you know, uh, I hear what you're saying and I can totally see where that's coming from. Have you thought about this? Here's a piece of information that perhaps you haven't heard. And that's a lot of what I got is, boy, I never thought about it that way. Oh, I hadn't heard that before. Um, but that's because I sat down and just listened to them. And it took me fucking years to figure that shit out. Yeah, like I went through my early 20s just snapping at people like that and getting nothing out of it. it took me years. It's super difficult. It's very hard. And you need like, I don't know, a million pounds of patience to get through that. And if you don't do it consistently, they tend to kind of slip back to, uh, you know, to, to, to their homeostasis of, you know, run like a Mexican holding a TV or whatever the fuck that quote was. Um, they go back to that because that's their, that's, that's the homeostasis. That's the origin point. And if you don't keep pulling them, you know, you're never going to shift that homeostasis over to a more uh, progressive side. It's the same thing goes with politics. If we don't push our politicians to take a more progressive stance, then that Overton window is never going to shift on a political level. Okay. Um, what most liberals tend to, fail, uh, tend to fail to realize is that it's a lack of experience with those groups of people. Liberals tend to make moral judgments about these people uh, because of these things. These people, in their view, we must believe uh, these things because they are terrible, immoral people. They believe uh, that these people must be irredeemable because who doesn't know uh, that such things are wrong today? I have a whole story about this on my album, Empathy on Sale, which is available for free uh, on my banking. Uh, it's the Uncle Marv story. If you've if you've seen me do stand up in the last couple of years, you've heard the Uncle Marv story. It's one of my favorite stories. It's a super important story. Uh, it's what got uh, somebody to threaten to decapitate me at one point. It's a, it's a good story, guys. Um, <laughs> um, that's not it. It's a real lack of realness to them. The only place that most of these minority communities exist to them is on television, which is never set where they are. It's set in cities far away from them. They don't see that their reality represented to them with any fairness. My family had to learn the hard way why black jokes aren't cool after my sister married a black man from Chicago. They just don't know. You understand, like, to my ex-wife's family, like, I was the first, like, immigrant Indian kid that they ever met. So I sat down and just had a conversation with them and kind of had to be like, okay, you're going to make this weird fucking joke, but it's because you've just, like, never fucking really met 
an Indian, like you, the only Indian person you know is a doctor. That's why you make doctor jokes all the time. <laughs> like that's, that's part of the thing, right? <laughs> uh, it was suddenly real to them. An increasing Hispanic population in my home area, working a lot of the dairy jobs has been creating an interesting split. The people who interact with them constantly, like the dairy farms that hire them, have done a 180 on Mexican jokes and anti-Hispanic rhetoric. People who don't interact with that community regularly are set in their old ways, and it's causing a lot of friction. Not just between the Hispanic community and the bigoted population, but between the two white communities. My people are welcoming to the people they actually know. When something happens, we all pitch into the fundraiser and grab their chain chainsaws to get a tree off of somebody's house after a bad storm. Doesn't matter who you are and what you look like or what your sexual orientation or non-binary gender is. This is the most dangerous thing to the oligarchs. Fred Hampton, who was, who was one of the most influential Black Panther leaders, was 23. Um, he started out in the, in the Panther Party when he was about 20 and became a very prolific community organizer and leader in Chicago, was fucking murdered by the Chicago police and the FBI because he talked to white rural people. And he was bringing them into the coalition and starting a movement within... Black people and white people and Hispanic people and Chinese people and everybody was coming together. And that was scary because J. Edgar Hoover was a paranoid old white man that believed that the black messiah was coming to start a race war because him and Charlie Manson are basically the same fucking person. And then Fred Hampton, because he was starting a movement, was fucking murdered. This is the scariest thing to the deep state, to the intelligence community, to the corporate oligarchs, that all of the workers look beyond their identities, there's no longer that split, and they fucking attack you. That's what they do. That's how they fucking operate. This is the most dangerous fucking thing. Once you see outside this worldview, once you see outside this individualistic mindset of this ego-driven American exceptionalism bullshit and start cooperating with each other where it doesn't matter what your identity or sexuality is, where you're just people and you can get along and learn and understand and, and, and work together for common good causes, that's the scariest fucking thing. And you'll see them use their propaganda machines like the New York Times or MSNBC or CNN or Fox News, and they'll spin it so that people start dividing themselves up again. <sighs> Where do they? Okay. <laughs> Keep losing my place. I'm sorry. Okay, but this isn't reported. This isn't what makes it into the portrayals of my people on television. Nobody makes a national broadcast over aerial television uh, show out of rural Wisconsin that depicts the positives of rural life as it is. Even on cable, every show I've ever watched doesn't honor the rural consciousness. It treats it as a joke or an exaggeration. At worst, we are a land of serial killers, deplorables, and poor people. And if we weren't hanging, hanging on by a raggedy thread, maybe we could take it. Maybe. But we are. My people feel humiliated by you. And ultimately, humiliation is the root of all terrorism. And there are some uh, serious fences to mend here, and it's going to take a lot of effort to rebuild the measure of trust. That's, that's made a lot harder by something I'll discuss later. Okay, I do want to read some of your comments and see uh, where, uh, where we go from here. Uh, Jay Jackson's tuning in. Hi, Jay. History lessons with Chris. I know. Yeah, that's what these are. Uh, these are turning into Chris Tree. Oh man, that's a good hashtag, Jay. That's a good hashtag. <laughs> the I would. I actually. Yeah. I. I literally just had that thought right, as I stopped reading. Is the the maga dude uh, from our coffee shop show? Uh, so if you don't know, uh, Jay, very funny comedian, incredible singer, by the way, too. Um, he lives in in Little Rock, and we did a show at uh, Guillermo Coffee House last year. And before our show, there was this like, like everything against his current administration was a poetry show. <laughs> and it was this lesbian, Latino, non-binary poet. And she read some pretty heavy, like anti-Trump poems. And there was a dude in a MAGA hat that sat through fucking all of it, all of it. He sat through all of it. And then he sat through our show. Jay is a black gay 
uh, military person. <laughs> I'm a immigrant socialist comedian, and he sat through the entire show. And the worst thing that happened was I didn't get to talk to him after the show because he had been in the coffee shop for what I presume is four hours. But that dude fucking sat through something that he shouldn't have enjoyed. <laughs> Tabitha. Uh, this is us. I support Amendment 2, but the crazed dingbats with guns in state capitals displaying their white privilege. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the, that guy just wanted us to be responsible with, with guns and not uh, not take it away. Uh, John Sheehan. Uh, my mom used to call me every time the Big Bang Theory made a comic book reference and asked me if I was watching. And I was like, no, I'm not watching the nerd minstrel show. <laughs> yes, that show is also insulting to nerd culture. <laughs> Uh, Jay, you made me think of something I have been wondering off and on for the past two weeks. How did it come to pass that these protests to reopen states under quarantine orders uh, get co-opted by Second Amendment fanatics and the alt-right movements? Yeah, I, I've been uh, uh, thinking about that too. And I think I think it's just... It's paranoia. It's it's the it's this kind of understanding that the government with progressive policies isn't out to make real progressive policies. They you know they're they're out to increase your tax on uh, on your on your land assets and come for your wealth and and so on and so forth. So then they kind of have to take these militia routes and grab their guns and go you know fight the government as as the militia did back in back in the old days. Um, and then you know the narrative gets co opted where it's not let's sit down and talk to these people and ask them the question of like, Hey, what are you afraid of? Why do you think we should reopen the States without any sort of um, real plan in place? Right. Um, I've been saying this for weeks. I think herd immunity is probably the way forward, but herd immunity, just like social distancing and quarantine without a medical treatment plan, um, without a economic plan is kind of doomed to fail. So whatever we do going forward has to have a plan that involves medical treatment and um, an economic plan. And I think because there isn't one, uh, their fear is being twisted into reopen the states. I don't know what to do and I'm scared. Uh, so I get it. I don't agree with it, but I understand where it's coming from. And it sucks because that's I think that's a real fear that we all have is like, what the fuck is happening? Um, and what are we going to do? Like, how are we going to move forward from this? So, yeah. And I think because they carry guns, they they get looped into all of them get looped into the anti-vaxxers or the the Second Amendment people or the alt-right people who also kind of have this like go against the government mentality. <laughs> John Sheehan, fantastic musician, by the way, uh, does live streams every Monday that you should check out. Uh, have you ever heard about the rural purge on CBS. They canceled Green Acres uh, and other rural shows in the late sixties because of bad ratings, but because they didn't want their brand to be associated with country folk. Uh, Green Acres is an amazing show. Check it out if you haven't seen it. I have not seen it. Um, early seventies. I will have to check that out. I'll have to add that to my list. I am working my way through Star Trek right now. Uh, and once I finish that, uh, and once uh, Captain John Luke Picard accepts my dad ship, uh, when he becomes my dad, I'm doing fine in the quarantine, you guys. Uh, I, I, I will have to check out some Green Acres. I've heard about this show, actually. Um, you know what's a really uh, another great show uh, that uh, John and, and you guys should check out? It's on Netflix. It's a show called The Ranch. Uh, the first season has a bunch of, like, goofy kind of sitcom -y jokes, but Season two onwards, it really starts to pick up, and the dramatic, um, the dramatic scenes are really, really good, you guys. Um, and uh, you know, Ashton Kutcher does a really great job in that show. Um, uh, Sam, shit, it's the dude with the mustache, and I'm and I'm losing his name. If you remember this guy's name, he was in uh, he was in the uh, the Big Lebowski. Sam Elliott, Sam Elliott, Sam Elliott. He's in it. Great, it's a really good show. It really kind of shows you um, how, like, what conservative ranchers have to go through and how the conservative side has to deal with corporate control of land, uh, kind of like what this article is talking about.
What's going on, everybody? If you enjoyed this video, there is more stuff like this coming on this channel, so make sure you hit that subscribe button. Hit that bell icon to make sure you're getting updates about my videos. Make sure you hit that like button, because uh, I think there's a dislike campaign happening on the channel. There's like one person that's just disliking all my shit. That's weird. Uh, but uh, make sure you hit the like button. Make sure you hit the share button. Get the word out about this channel. Uh, and there are going to be more videos like this. But if you enjoy this video and you want to be a part of the live comedy experience in this virtual world that we're living in now, uh, where, uh, where all the performance art is going virtual uh, for the time being, you can join my Zoom live stand-up comedy shows. It's called the Citizen Revolution Comedy Show. Uh, the first one is on May 8th, uh, and they will be consecutively every other week. All of the dates are available on my website right now, ramennoodlescomedy.com. That's R-A-M-A-N, noodlescomedy.com. Go grab your tickets right now. They're only five bucks. Five bucks gets you in, um, and it's five bucks per residence, not five bucks per person. Uh, it's just to grab you a spot. Uh, so go to my website, ramennoodlescomedy.com. That's R-A-M-A-N, noodlescomedy.com. Grab your ticket. Come hang out with me. Uh, if you can, you can become a sustaining member over on the website. Sustaining members get free tickets uh, to come see the Zoom virtual Citizen Revolution comedy show. Um, or you can make a one-time donation as well. Uh, but all of this stuff helps keep me afloat, uh, keeps me uh, being able to put food on the table uh, and cover all of my bills and expenses uh, to make sure that I'm putting out regular content. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for subscribing. Hope to see you again. Stay safe.